So our last speaker of the day will be Richard Farnish. Um, Richard will be presenting about plant operation and stability induced by segregation of foodburg solids. Again, a contribution by the Wolfson Center of the University of Greenwich. A little bit background about Richard. Richard is a shattered engineer with more than 25 years experience in troubleshooting dry solids process plants in the UK and overseas. As said, he is employed by the University of Greenwich to provide consultancy and educational delivery to undergraduate students and engineers from industries. And um, we are very pleased to have him here today. So over to you, Richard. Thank you very much. Um, if I can just quickly say something about the last question about the Hausner ratio, just really quickly. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 I would just say that the Hausner ratio is really a, uh, a measurement which enables you to put a label onto your material. So in the same way that an angle of repose can be interpreted to say this material is poorly flowing or free flowing. Similarly with the Hausner ratio, it enables you to put a number and a label onto a material, but it's not a direct measurement of the flowability and you can't actually interpret it to come up with a design solution. So the Hausner ratio, is, it's useful, it's very widely used in the pharmaceutical sectors, but actually it's not truly a measurement of the flowability, it's simply an indicator. Okay, thank you for letting me uh, <laughs> have that say. Okay, thank you, Richard. No problem. No That's problem. all yours. Cheers. Okay, so what we've got here, hopefully, you can all see the, the first presentation there. Okay, so what we've got here is just a, a, a quick look at how the deblending or segregation of materials can induce significant. Um, process control and process quality problems within a, a production process. So in the, for the purposes of the, uh, the talk we've got here, we should think about segregation as being a shift in the bulk behavior as a function of the redistribution of, start of, of particles. So this, this segregation or redistribution of particles within a mass can correlate to either a raw material with a nominally wide range of characteristics, so you have segregation within a mono material, or it could be you've got a blended product um, and you're finding that actually the homogeneity of the blend, where you validated it at the blender, you're finding that actually at the end of the production process, that homogeneity has become compromised in some way. And that lack of the shifting homogeneity is usually going to be a function of segregation. Now, again, throughout much of this paper, I'll be talking about things like size distribution, uh, because that is the most commonly accepted metric when we're talking about segregation. But what we what's very important to remember is if you're troubleshooting or investigating deblending problems on your process, and typically that would be undertaken through your own QA lab, um, focusing just on the size distribution as your metric would be a fairly normal approach to adopt. But it's very important that you remember that materials that differ by particle size, particle shape, particle density, or surface morphology can all exhibit very different behaviors when you're in a dynamic hand handling uh, scenario. So we need to think about different aspects of the, the, the particles when we're actually handling them on the process. And, uh, you know, where we have segregation occurring on processes, the implications vary from industry to industry. You know, it could be if we were thinking about um, maybe making a powdered soup, for instance, it might be that if we were to do a flavor analysis or a production run of sachets, we might find that the, the soup in the initial sachets um, maybe has a, um, a more viscousness, high, high viscosity, we mix it in with the required amount of liquid. We may find that we have dispersion problems because we've got 
lumps of powder that are floating on the top of the liquid instead of dispersing into it. And you might find at the other end of the production batch, you've got, you've got um, soups that are a bit wishy-washy when they're mixed in. So they haven't got so much sort of thickness to them. That's fairly common in terms of food product. Equally, if you're producing um, biscuits or a brittle end product, then you could find that actually you're getting uh, baked products that are disassembling themselves as they go through the handling process. Um, it could be if you're working with something like say uh, spray dried coffee, you'll find that you've got a really nice high quality granule coming out of the spray dryer. But actually by the time it gets to the receiving bins and dropped into the pack out line, you'll find that all of a sudden we've got this dust that's come from somewhere. So you've got, again, a functional performance issue there. It tastes as good as anything, but the consumer per perception of what they're receiving is diminished. Um, if we look at things like stick packs, uh, bags, you know, even um, cubic meter bags of materials, you know, inconsistency in the volumetric or weight filling of these things, again, is a very common consequence of de-blending of bulk materials. So it has a lot of problems in that respect. Bulk density fluctuations are also commonly associated with uh, de-blending of materials. And also another unfortunate consequence is that you'll, you'll start to have um, unstable discharge from equipment. You know, if you're looking at gravity transfers, you'll find that the flow is erratic. Sometimes it stops. And often you typically find that you've got an ongoing issue with material retention inside process equipment. And it's because of the redistribution of particle sizes and the consequent changes in flow behavior that derives from that. Now, you know, that's a pretty much a, a, a nightmare list I've given you there, but there are other ways that segregation can affect industries. And it purely comes down to the sensitivity um, of the product, the, the accuracy and consistency that your market requires, and of course, the way that you're handling the materials. So every single segregation issue that can be encountered is normally subtly different from any other you come across because it's driven by uh, local factory requirements. So there are actually other unfortunate side effects, but uh, we only have so much time. So um, it's important to remember that even if within your process, you validate your blenders, and most companies will undergo some form of validation of the blenders to assure that everything is okay, um, you'd be very much mistaken if you design, configure your process on the assumption that what comes out of the blender is what's going to be appearing at the end of the line. You'd be a very fortunate uh, manufacturer for that to happen. Um, very commonly, you'll find that there will be some degree of shift in the size distribution or blend quality that results through the process. And you know, if we talk to um, plant engineers, um, a very, very common misconception is that when they see that there's been a shift in the quality of the product towards the end of the, uh, the process, more often than not, the prime suspect in their mind is the pneumatic conveying system, if that's what's been used. And of course, in their mind, what they're thinking is, we've got a reception hopper, which is filled from the blender. So that's not doing anything. It's simply a receptacle to hold the blend. We've got the pneumatic conveying line, and then we've got a receiving vessel or multiple receiving vessels at the end of the line. And it's at that point we see a problem. So to their mind, the only thing that's happened that has any nature of uh, dynamics to it is the material going through the pipeline. Therefore, in their mind, the pipeline is the cause of the problem. And in the vast majority of cases, that's completely incorrect. The only contribution that a pneumatic pipeline, whether it's positive or negative pressure, can have on segregation occurring at the end vessel 
is simply if it's if you're using an excessive velocity or you've got too many bends in the system and therefore you're unintentionally degrading the particles that you're transferring and of course what you find when you degrade a particle is not typically that the particle shatters what you'll typically find is that the corners and edges of the particles are abraded and introduce a fine content that was not there immediately after the blender. And of course, the wider the site distribution becomes, or the wider the difference in particle properties becomes, the greater the uh, deblending is going to become. But most typically, it's not down to the pneumatic conveyor. Most typically, it's down to the hoppers and the way that they're filled. So I'm going to give you some examples now so you can see what I'm talking about. So what we've got here is uh, probably one of the most common types of segregation. This is where we've got a vessel being filled uh, by, by gravity. So we've got a central fill. And of course, what you've got is a mass of material that's accumulating and forming a heap whose apex is underneath the fill point. So if you fill off center, the apex is off center. But essentially what you've got here is a problem that, that relates to the coarser materials that tend to be maybe slightly more free flowing in their nature, but also have a fines content. And what you find is as the heap slope formation develops, you've got material landing on top of that apex. Now, if we consider a distribution of particle sizes, we would find that the larger particles tend to be more free flowing and the finer particles tend to be, tend to err uh, towards being more, uh, more cohesive, less free flowing. So with the deposition of material on the apex of a heap, you've got a situation where the particles have all got kinetic energy to dispose of, but the more free flowing material can do it more effectively. And therefore they'll roll or avalanche down the slope length until they're arrested at the internal surface of the container they're being filled into. The less free flowing material can't move so easily and tends to reside on a center line underneath the fill point. So you've got this lateral de-blending with coarse to the outside, fines to the center, and it's being caused by what's called surface effect segregation. You can see an example here on a quarry. Um, if we change the scale of the photograph, this could just as easily be granulated coffee or some other friable material with a, with a fines content and a coarse content attributed to it. It's exactly the same mechanism, just a different scale. Now, alternatively, if we load in uh, pneumatically, um, let's say we've got a, uh, a tangential entry into a receiving vessel. Well, clearly the material is going to come into contact with the walls of vessel and it will decelerate through frictional contact. Bear in mind the velocity at this point entering the bin is likely to be in the high 20 meter a second range. So there's a fair bit of energy to dispose of. And what you find in this situation, again, is the more mobile material would tend to come down towards the center line and the less mobile will disengage towards the periphery. So now you've got an inverse radial segregation, but the only difference is the way you've loaded the bin. So now if we look at a bin that's loaded vertically downwards, we now get another different segregation pattern. Now what we've got is a 25 meter a second or greater downwards uh, blast of conveying gas and particles into a mass of material that's increasing in depth. So clearly what you actually end up with is a direct gas interaction between the incoming material and the previously deposited product in there. And of course, what this does is to cause a huge amount of turbulence in the headspace of the bin. After the batch transfer is finished, basically the headspace of the bin operates like an air classifier with the more buoyant particles settling down last. And of course, the net result of this is that now what we've got is a stratification of particle sizes or particle masses, whereby the material in the bulk of the silo is not, not too um, bad, it's not too far out of spec, but you have a significant increase in fines presence 
on the top surface or in the top strata of the material in the bin. So now you've got a, a segregation through the vertical axis. If we blow material pneumatically into a bin, so we're looking at a perpendicular entry, clearly material is going to be transported across the bin, impact on the far side, and then it's going to tend to roll back down underneath the fill point. So now we've got course underneath the fill point on one side of the bin and increasing fines on the opposing face of the bin. So now we've got lateral segregation. So you can see just the way that you load the material into a vessel after it's come from the blender, the, the, the velocities that you use, the nature of the product, the characteristics of the material will dictate how severe the deblending actually is that occurs on the process. And of course, in the situation we're showing here, we've got course on this side, fines on the opposing side. So it follows that when the outlet is activated, we're going to get a more free flowing discharge down this side of the bin and probably a cliff formation on the opposing side, which may be stable or unstable. If it's unstable and it collapses into what would be a, a, a increasing void on the free flowing side, you'll tend to find that by virtue of being fines, fines rich, it will retain air and quite likely you'll get what's called flooding or flushing occurring through the outlet. So you can see how the pneumatic conveying system does very little. It's actually the way the material is fed into the bins that creates the original segregation variation. But then the next problem is how do you take it out of the bin? And again, in the vast majority of cases, you'll find that extraction from a bin, if we're using an auger, if we're using a rotary valve, if we're using a belt, it doesn't really matter what, you'll find that nine times out of 10, you're looking at the generation of a preferential flow channel. Even if you're looking at straightforward gravity discharge, the chances are that the flow channel will be preferential. And this is what's known as core flow. The problem with this being, of course, we can imagine that if we've got a radial segregation in here, um, clearly this is going to have a strong influence over um, what comes out into the process next. So if we were to analyze the output of a core flow system, and you know, typically, almost as a default, all industrial equipment is core flow, then what you find occurring is that if you were to sample from the outlet, assuming here we're looking at radial segregation with a uh, preferential drawdown, you'd find that the core, the central region gets extracted first. Of course, that's where the fines are in their highest concentration. So we have a high fines content, which decreases over time. And we have a low coarse content because the course is at the side of the bin, which increases with time as the core becomes depleted. So you get this drift in characteristics from start to finish. And these characteristics could correlate to bulk density, they could relate to flavor, they could relate to mechanical performance. But if you sample the outlet periodically, you'll find you get this drift and it comes from the deblending of material coming into the vessel. Now, using measurements obtained from a shear tester, if you were to prepare samples to different uh, median particle size, mean particle diameters, so here we've got 20, 40, 100, 170 mean diameters, you'd find that the flow functions would follow this general sort of trend, with the coarser material having the least strength and the finest material having the greatest strength. So what these um, lines correlate to are the, the physical flow behaviors of the material with material having a shallow flow function being free flowing and easy to work with material being uh, uh, possessing a steeper flow function being less easy to work with more cohesive and therefore nominally more problematic when you handle it through standard industrial equipment so what we've got here is an example that shows you what actually happens if you have a shift in blend composition? So what we've got here is a material 
that I've artificially created to give us a fine in the core. So this material had a size distribution from dust up to uh, 800 microns. What I did was to screen out the sub 250 plus 150 fraction and called the upper limit the course, the lower limit the fines. So 0 100 at this point means it's all fines. Sorry, 100 to 0 means it's all fines. 0 to 100 means it's all course. And what we've got here are measurements of the gas permeability of a constrained bed at a fixed airflow rate, up, a fixed upwards air velocity, so airflow rate. And what you find is when you have coarse only content, as we know from the flow function measurements, it's going to be free flowing. And correlating to that is you'll see that it's got high permeability, so a low resistance to air passage. A 10% increase in fines will give us a deterioration in the flow function, but also you can see here, it gives you a deterioration in the permeability. 20% fines, even further. And then somewhere between 20 and 30% fines by volume, what you find happens is actually there's no further deterioration in the permeability. So the initial deterioration going from no fines to about 25%, that initial deterioration is caused by the part of the fines packing in between the course and blanking off the air passageways. But as, doing, as it's doing that, it's also increasing the number of contact points within the bulk. Hence, the flow behavior starts to deteriorate as well as the gas permeability. Once you get to about 25% fines by volume, then effectively, even though 75% of your mixture is nominally coarse content, actually the coarse content is a passenger on the fines. So from 25% to 100% fines, things don't change from a gas permeability perspective because the entire mixture is now dominated by the localized fines. So again, thinking back to our different distribution of particles that can happen when filling a bin, you know, depending upon the severity of the segregation, at any time during that discharge, you can shift from free flowing to cohesive behavior, depending upon the composition of material as it's extracted out of the vessel. So that's a, a major consideration that segregation doesn't just mean changes in flavor or texture of an end product, it also has a big impact upon whether the material can actually flow. Because the more impermeable a material becomes, the less free flowing it becomes. So here's a very idea, idealized sketch where we've got a bulk silo feeding into a batch hopper, feeding on, I've shown it here to a packaging line, but it could be anything really. So on the bulk silo, we know, because these are all going to be core flow as a default, we know that as the level of material drops, so as the inventory level drops over time, so the material constituents will change over time at the outlet because of segregation. We also know with, with the batch hopper, as that inventory level drops, so we also get a change in the composition. So what the batch hopper is doing it's providing a segregation of segregation. So this bottom graph here shows what's happening. So in the batch hopper, level drops down to trigger a recall, it gets refilled. So what it's done in effect is to take a slice of the output from the bulk silo. And this progresses over time and you get this sawtooth sort of progressive change in material. But what you've actually got there, of course, is a drift over time of some average characteristic, which reflects what's coming out of the bulk silo. Now, again, this is still very ide a very idealistic and conceptual drawing because no one in their right mind would empty a bulk silo completely down to empty. So typically what happens is the bulk silos get refilled at 50%. So here we go, bulk silo again, inventory level is dropping, it's refilled and then it drops again. So monitoring the outlet, we've got a drift in properties. It then resets itself with fresh material and then starts to change again. 
But the critical thing is on the production line, what happens is we get the sawtooth reflecting the pre-fill condition, but because it's core flow and therefore operates on a first in first out basis, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, first in last out basis, it means fresh material always comes through first. So when we refill on the bulk silo, fresh product comes immediately onto the batch hopper. So it means that, that this reset we see here on the bulk silo occurs within the process hall as well before reverting back to a more regular um, drift in properties. So what this means is that because often the bulk silo is disassociated from the packing hall or that part of the process line, is you get these seemingly random situations where the machine goes out of range so far as control, weight control or whatever. And there'll be enormous amounts of time and effort spent troubleshooting the packing line when actually the problem has occurred back at the bulk silo. So that's instability as a function of segregation as a function of core flow discharge. So we've just got a couple of case studies here. And uh, just to illustrate this, this is some industrial data. So on the vertical axis, we've got pack weight in grams. Horizontal axis relates to the number of sachets that have gone out and the changing over to new ingredient bags. So this is a vertical auger packer controlled by a human. So there's no, there's no uh, built-in feedback control. It's just this guy taking random samples, weighing them, and then adjusting the speed of the vertical auger. And this is what he's achieving. Now, if we look at the data for this, so this is the horizontal axis, so we can see what's being, what's being produced and when new bag changes take place. We can see the auger speed that he was operating with, and we can see the average pack weight that he was achieving. So if we divide the average pack weight by the RPM, we can obtain an average weight per revolution. So with that information, we can now say, okay, well, what would have happened on this production line if this guy hadn't turned up for his shift and they just simply left the machine running at, for argument's sake, 190 RPM? And you'll see something quite interesting. So the blue line represents what he was achieving by adjustment. The red line is what you get if you look at what the weights would be if there was no variation in speed on the packing auger. But also we can see the change over to new material. So we can see very clearly that when this new bag came on, we can see that the average weight came down. When the next new bag came on, the average weight went down. So because things like auger packers are volumetric devices, clearly if you see weights shifting, it's a function of a shift in bulk density. And if bulk density is shifting, that's a function of segregation. So the point I'm making here is, even within bags of ingredients, you can have segregation. Now these would have been ripped and tipped into a buffer bin. And of course that buffer bin would have been core flow. And that in all likelihood is where this segregation that we see here came from. Now, of course, many systems don't have manual feedback. You've got automated systems, so you may not see this. But when you do get systems that become randomly unstable or you've got seem to have an ongoing drift, clearly that's an indicator that you've got segregation occurring in the process. So the second case study looks at a sachet filling line. So in this case, what we've got is a 14 lane stick pack filling machine. So we've got a buffer hopper up top here. We've got an agitator here that keeps the material uh, loose, shall we say. And we've got filling tubes that if I recall, were around about six, six to eight millimeters. Now the problem this company had was they found that the product they made, they had a base product, which had a small amount of active uh, a very large amount of excipient and probably only about, I don't know, 10% of flavoring. So their product line consisted of different flavored nutraceutical type products. And they found that 
this machine would work perfectly well with uh, an orange flavored product, but as soon as they put black currant flavored product into it, it wouldn't work, it wouldn't work properly. So this is where you can do some useful investigations. If you're running a stick pack line like this, obviously each one of the stick packs has an ID on it. So you can recognize the lane that it came from and its position within the batch when it was filled. So if you, like I had to do, spend two weeks weighing up an entire batch to reassemble the, the sachets in the sequence they came out at, but also to weigh them, to look at the weight variation, you can get some interesting data. So this is the standard deviation for pack weights for the blackcurrant material. So what these numbers along the bottom represent are the lanes. So lanes one to seven are shown in red, lanes eight to 14 are shown in blue. So four, um, this would the four would represent the sort of the center line of the, of the machine. And clearly what we can see here is that material at the outermost lanes has the best consistency and it gets worse towards the center line of the machine. So you've got more weight variation on the central lanes than you have on the outers. Now, again, going back to the picture, we've got a central fill point going on here. So that means we've got a heap formation and all the agitation in the world isn't gonna make any difference. So we've got a heap formation with fines dominance on the core, coarse dominance on the outside. And of course, where we've got fines, as we know, increase fines, reduce flowability. Reduce flowability means reduced repeatability in the discharge down the tubes and hence the variation. A lack of fines at the outside means the material is more free flowing and therefore more consistent. Now to prove this, now looking at the, the same, the data derived in the same way for the orange material, the orange flavor product, you can see it's virtually flat across the board. So the interesting point here is that clearly there is variation going on in this particular process, but through this analysis, you can say, okay, well, the only difference between these two materials, because they're using the same machine settings, the only difference is the flavoring. So the flavoring is interfering with the homogeneity because it's obviously segregating out more. So all that had to be done was to do analysis of the particle properties of the orange flavoring, size, density, shape, compare that to the black current particles properties, and then go to the marketplace to find a black current flavoring whose particle properties were close or matched those of the orange. So in that way, the problem is actually resolved by changing simply one of the blend components. So um, yeah, so you, when you've got segregation problems, you can make changes to the plant and the process, and normally that's the, the most viable option. But equally, if you've got enough analytical data, there's no reason why you can't change the composition of the materials that you're working with. And there are many, there are several well-proven analytical methods um, that can be applied to predict segregability. So in conclusion then, um, segregation is an ongoing challenge for many, many industries. Uh, I'd say probably all of them, but in many cases it goes undetected or um, undiagnosed. Um, there are characterization methods that can be used to look at the sensitivity of coarser materials to surface segregation or finer materials to air induced uh, elutration or separation. So you can actually be pre-warned and you can benchmark between materials to evaluate risk. Um, the critical thing I'd say to any of you that might be reviewing what's happening on your process plants is, yes, it is important to obtain information relating to 
size analysis when you're looking at segregation. But please remember, you've also got to consider shape, density, uh, and also surface morphology into your investigations. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Um, you may have noticed that Daniel's connection has completely collapsed, so he's disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> and he's really cross because he just rang me and he said, this was so interesting, I'm really very cross. So he will, as everybody else can, um, follow the, um, we will of course um, be putting this all on the website and we'll sort it. And we just want to say a huge thank you. Um, there don't appear to be at the moment any questions. I don't know if anybody has got I a question. I think I've like got one from Natalie. Oh I'm yes, speaking, sorry. I'm Natalie. seeing one there from Natalie. Perfect. Yeah, um, you are going to get segregation pretty much any way you, you fill a silo. Um, but there are ways to try and minimise the severity of it. You know, if you're thinking about the filling operations associated with uh, road tanker deliveries, and I suspect that might be one of the things you're thinking of here. Sadly, um, your scope for control over the velocities, because velocity is a very strong uh, part of the mechanism of deep blending, your control over the velocities is quite limited because many of the tanker drivers tend to use their own onboard um, two bar compressors and they're not shy about using as much air as they can get away with because their main interest is simply you know getting a rapid filling and getting out on the road again one way around it which is expensive but nonetheless I've seen some of the food manufacturers do this is to uh, use their own uh, land-based blowers so they can try and prevent the uh, tanker drivers from overfilling. Uh, one of the things you have to bear in mind with road tanker deliveries is that at the end of the delivery, you're left with a road tanker that's got a, a full tanker body at pressure, but a diminishing amount of material in the pipeline. And of course, when that happens, you get a situation where the resistance to the air pressure is reducing as the pipeline empties. And you get a rather unfortunate phenomenon known as blowdown, where the tanker, the volume of the tanker simply vents down through the pipeline. And when that happens, you can get uh, end of line velocities up into the 50s or 60s meters a second. So not only do you get a lot of excessive breakage and dust at the end of the transfer, but it's also going at high velocity. So discharging into a bin, uh, you can accept that there's going to be a given uh, segregation pattern associated with the method of filling, whether it's off center, whether it's vertically downwards or however. But the discharge from those silos um, can be modified to try and mitigate the worst effects. Unfortunately, in most cases, this requires the uh, conversion of a bin from core flow to mass flow, in which case you'd be looking at a review of the geometry of the cone and the uh, style of the feeder that's extracting. So you can minimize these effects. And for many companies, um, I think the important thing is that if they're trying to troubleshoot segregation problems, is that if they go into their troubleshooting and as a team they have the mindset, we're going to eliminate segregation, um, actually, that's, that's not actually helpful or realistic. What you need to do really as an upfront exercise before you get into that mindset is to evaluate how much variation do you actually have? How much variation can the process or the end or your customer tolerate and work on getting that down to an acceptable level? Because if you say you're going to eliminate it, and that actually is your mission plan, you're looking at a, a, a hugely, hugely expensive process. Whereas in actual fact, you could get good enough results from a much, much smaller budget and a much more focused approach. Brilliant, thank you, Richard. That's all right. It's just, you know, fascinating the whole subject is fascinating i can't believe there are so many problems to overcome and so much so many engineering solutions um so thank you very much indeed it's very much appreciated thank you to all our speakers and thank you to everybody who's attended 
and um, we look forward to the next um, event that Daniel comes up with. So please keep posted, keep, keep watching. I agree and see what, um, see what we're doing.